I certainly think it can be. And with that, um, I'll pass it to you, Lena. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Shanti. Thank you, Tess, for organizing this, for inviting me uh, for this wonderful opportunity to share with you my long-term project, which has been generally su generously supported by the Stillman Drake Fund and various travel grants and sabbatical leaves of Reed College. Um, so I've been translating, annotating, and introducing a rare work of Russian high modernism by Pavel Pavlovich Muratov, 1881 to 1950. It's entitled in Russian, Obrazi Itali, which literally means images of Italy, uh, but which I translate as evocations of Italy. So this translation will be published next year by Northwestern University Press. Evocations of Italy is a unique and utterly unclassifiable work about art and culture and memory that emerged in the waning years of the Silver Age of Russia's pre-Bolshevik humanist period. I will tell you promptly uh, in what ways this work is so astonishing, but first of all, let me fill you in on its very satisfying biography. So I first met, now how can I uh, change the slide? I am capable of doing it. So I first met Pavel Muratov, uh, an artillery officer, an art critic, curator, art historian, connoisseur, and a brilliant intellectual, actually a Renaissance man, if ever there was one, a man whom Clive James held up as an example of just how brilliant somebody can be and still be a forgotten man. Well, I first met him 50 years or so ago as a graduate student in a course on Russian emigre literature. I met him through his sprawling novella, Egeria, still untranslated. And I have been living with him ever since, most intimately in the last decade. That was when one of my thesis students, Michael Kunichika, who is now an associate professor of Russian at Amherst College, mentioned that he was honing his Russian by reading and translating this work 15 minutes a day. So we hatched a plan to collaborate, but his research took him in one direction and I then continued solo. So one day when I was idly scanning the Reed Library catalog, I discovered that our very own rare book room has the original 1924 edition of the entire three volumes. This is the edition that was tucked among the precious belongings in the luggage of every Russian intellectual fleeing Bolshevik Russia. And among these intellectuals were the Krivoshanes, parents of Professor Vera Krivoshane, who had the foresight and the stamina and the vision to establish Russian studies at Reed College shortly after World War II. So from Muratov to Krivoshane, from Krivoshane to Kunichika, from Kunichika to me, and very soon to you, dear future readers. I didn't realize when I undertook this work that it would take me, me nearly as long to translate Muratov's three volume aesthetic journey as it took him to accomplish those three trips to Italy between 1909 and 1911 to write and revise three volumes of the text to produce a plethora of art historical monographs, translations of Renaissance Italian novellas, edit an erudite art historical journal, and save hundreds of priceless icons from marauding Bolsheviks. By the way, a colleague, uh, an art historian, Wendy Salmond, is now translating his exquisite contributions on the art of Byzantium and uh, Russian medieval art. So I was drawn to Muratov for three reasons. Our shared love of Russian modernism, of art, and of Italy. 
translating and living with this work seemed to me to be the best way to interweave the three strands of my intellectual, professional, and personal lives, and to give Murata a new Anglophone audience at a moment of cultural crisis when his text, with its verbal pyrotechnic that experiential <laughs> triggers and intellectual provocations could once again do its magic with a new body of readers. According to a critic, Evocations of Italy is one of the most dazzling books of its kind ever written, a book on the grand tour that stands directly in the tradition of Goethe, Gregor Rovius, Burkhardt, Arthur Simons, Vernon Lee, but it's better than any of them, a real unknown masterpiece. Writing during and after several long pilgrimages to the sacred sites of the Italian Renaissance, with a detour to the classical ruins of southern Italy and Sicily, Murata created a trilogy that's at once a memoir of his own aesthetic evolution, a survey of his massive erudite library, and a guide specifically oriented to his generation of the Silver Age. I might mention that in working on my first draft, I followed Muratov from place to place, his volumes in hand. So it was an absolute joy and pleasure of discovery of being able to juxtapose the text with the experience of being there. <clears throat> the trilogy is the work of a young man, impassioned, greedily drinking in beauty, art, landscape, and sensual experiences. His dearest friend, Boris Zaitsev, to whom the trilogy is dedicated, wrote in his reminiscences of the author, the roots of evocations of Italy lie in Italian soil. Like everything essential, they are born of love. The success of evocations was tremendous, beyond dispute. In Russian literature, it has no equal in the artistic depth of its experience of Italy, in erudition, and in the elegance of execution. These volumes are in tune with that phase of Russian spiritual development when our culture, in a brief renaissance or silver age, emerged from the provincialism of the late 19th century into a brief, tragic flowering of the early 20th century. Muratov argues that an intensely felt aesthetic experience preserves our humanist and humane essence in the face of creeping philistinism, nihilism, cultural decline, and that the challenges to the human spirit everywhere lurking in pre-revolutionary Russia. While the Bolsheviks from their various perches in exile, prison, and hiding were plotting their future socialist utopia, Muratov was engaged in invoking the principles and values of the humanist revolution of the 14th and 15th centuries that catapulted the Western world to a renewal of rational inquiry, liberated from superstition, and empowered to explore and realize the vast potential of the human spirit to envision and enact an ideal social order. So in this respect, he was a child of the Silver Age. The writers, the artists, the theologians, the musicians of those barely two decades were converts to a secular religion of beauty that included the mystical belief in the civilizational capacity of art to organize society by remodeling the human personality through the manipulation of the sense perceptible properties of various art forms. Muratov's aesthetic experiential text is part of the Russian modernists' energetic exploration of Italian civilization and history. There was Dmitry Mirishkovsky's monumental biography of Leonardo da Vinci, Zinaida Kipius's travels to Sicily, Vasily Rosanov's travels to Venice and Rome, Vyacheslav Ivanov and Alexander Brock and their Italian poems, Benoit rediscovering 
the Commedia dell'arte, the Silver Age experienced what might be called its Italian moment. But what produces such excitement among the Russian modernists in their encounter with Italy is what they take as the model of a culture that's anchored in aesthetics, in the appreciation of beauty. It's tempting to take just a small step back in time to appreciate how central in a Russian cultural history is the notion of beauty as foundational to an ideal social order. We can gesture here to the legend of Saint Vladimir's conversion to the Orthodox faith that was apparently motivated by the unearthly beauty of the, of the Greek Orthodox ritual architecture painting. We can trace it back to Dostoevsky's dictum that beauty will save the world, to the aesthetic theology of Vladimir Samadyov. All of Muratov's writings spring from this wellspring. His entire corpus of writing is permeated with the idea that beauty will save the world. Characteristic as, uh, as it might be uh, ideologically, Muratov's text is an outlier, even by the wildly experimental standards of Russian modernism. To this day, scholars and critics have been baffled by this strange work, and so it has remained undeservedly outside the canon of monumental modernism. It is, according to one contemporary Russian scholar, neither art history nor a guide to churches and museums. It is not the diary of an Italian pilgrim, and in general, it's an undefinable type of literary work. In terms of its familiarity with various details, it's almost a monograph. In terms of the inspired narrative and even its form, it seems to be epic poetry and in certain passages, deeply moving in the lyricism of the transport in the face of beauty. In Evocations of Italy, Muratov's literary prowess lies in his ability to uh, insert myriad contrapuntal and harmonizing voices to capture the great beauty that is Italy. Masterfully, he plays off contrasting moods, contrasting registers. He frames every vision and every dispatch of Italy for multiple simultaneous impressions. Each of the narrative voices sounds concurrently and informs one another to capture the essence of Italy as a world filled with enchantment. Here he's writing about Rome, and I realize that the images that I am showing you uh, are in some way thematizing uh, what Maratha does, and that is that they are images of places that don't correspond necessarily with the places about which I'm reading, but they give you something to let your mind and eye wander as I prattle on. But here is Murato writing about Rome. In the small piazza of the church of Santa Eustachia, Boromini's fantastical corkscrew lantern spirals above the old Palazzo della Sapienza. The street following its wall leads to the Parione, full of palaces and Baroque churches glowing with the smile of Rome's street life. Here, every detail is imbued with the innate aristocratic spirit of an ancient people. There is a dignity and nobility that radiates equally from cornices framing a blue sash of sky, from the gold-tipped shadows of a vegetable stall from the sarcophagus set beneath a spout deep inside a palace portal, from the clatter of wheels on the massive cobblestones, the bouquet of wine trailing wagons from Frascati, the fragrance of candles and incense wafting through the half-open doors of a church, the footsteps of passing priests, and the big yellow lemons on the cart 
of a vendor peddling ices. Here, every sense impression is somehow more acute than usual. Something like this must certainly have been intrinsic to ancient civilization. And aware of this, the Greeks and Romans must have felt entitled to look down on other civilizations as barbaric. Happy indeed are they who in December, leaving behind the chill of shady streets, climb to the ever sunny Pincio to bask in the beneficent warmth who stand on the topmost landing on restless nights when the stifling Shiroko diddles the flames of street lamps and twists the jets of fountains, who in the blinding brilliance of late spring seek here some favorite rose or sprig of jasmine with its pungent and ancient perfume. The happiness Rome gives us has something of the happiness of youth, that trembling anticipation of each new day, that smiling surrender to sleep at the thought of the next day, full of faith in the unspent riches of life, that thoughtless squandering of joy, because it seems to gush unchecked from inexhaustible springs. As I discovered along with other enchanted readers, the experiential impact of Muratov's work is transportative, a firing of all psychosensory neurons, intellectual, sensory, and tactile, somatic. The art historian Ettore Logato notes that Muratov's descriptions did not only bear the character of an aesthetic study, but were vibrantly alive into the pages devoted to a description of daily life were inserted works of art. Muratov himself seems to accompany the reader into his itinerary, which the reader in turn recreated for himself with such vividness that he no longer needs a guide. So creating this feat of transporting the reader into the immediate experience of the genius loci turned out to be Muratov's fundamental objective for all of literature. He insisted that a work of art works, succeeds only if it awakens in us an empathetic response. There is a deliberate aesthetic sense in Muratov's apparent madness of the vertiginous succession of genres and his complex voicing and obsessive synesthesia. Muratov does not commit himself to a single voice, to a single set of genre conventions that once recognized by the reader will lock the reader into an orientation in just one dimension. Instead, he performs these dazzling changes of tone and genre. In this respect, he demonstrates a literary analog to the capacity of the overtoned throat singers of the tuba to throw out in a feat of vocal alchemy, which sounds like two or three or even four distinct pitches coming from different nerve centers of the soul. On the one hand, He's offering us documents, histories, journals, the whole story of Casanova, for example, memoranda, essays, eyewitness accounts, uh, lists of his favorite wines in Italy, narrative histories, official reports, chronicles, dramatic works, epic poems, a plethora of textual representations of Italy, its art, and its people. And on the other hand, he witnesses and gives, establishes his discursive authority by the immediacy of his witnessing. He bears witness in, on, and through his bound body, his own senses. And as a witness, he enacts a form of significant and paradigmatic seeing, to see as Morato sees, as he would have his readers see is to secure the significance of what might otherwise be invisible or deemed insignificant. 
As a witness, he offers himself as a point of contact between us, the readers, and what is out there beyond our experiencing. He is the emblematic pilgrim on whom we model our own pilgrimages of the spirit. For him, the ability to attend to the beauty of the everyday is triggered by three things. Contemplation of artistic masterpieces, knowledge of the circumstances of their emergence, impact, and reception, and attention to one's own sensory and affective responses. Consider this picnic in Pestum. And here is Muratov again. The roses of Pestum were celebrated by Roman poets. Now, of course, none are growing here. The thickets of scrub surround temples. Weeds sprout between the honey gold stones and dangle from the pediments. On the day we were there, a spring breeze stirred these shrubs and grasses to and fro, and in the absolute silence, only their faint and melancholy whisper could be heard. The silence was so deep that we could even hear the rustling of innumerable emerald lizards energetically scurrying along the steps and columns. Among the remains of winter vegetation, we found a profusion of acanthus, the plant sacred to Greek art. The shadow of its serrated leaves lay on the stones in a pattern of classical arabesques. We spent the entire day in Pestum, and there, among the ruins, ate the bread, cheese, and dried taranto figs we brought from Sanerno. The sunset, framed by columns, was magnificent. The mountains of the Gulf of Salerno and Calabria blazed with the solemn lights of sunset, purple, gold, lilac, blue, rose. A faint orange flame of the fading light flitted across the columns and melted into the greenish spring sky. A deep peace enveloped the temples. As swiftly as that moment, entire millennia slipped by. For me, translating this work was so compelling because it promised to take me into the laboratory of devices and techniques by which mere words on a page can perform this transformative alchemy. How does the author use point of view, deixis, phenomenal, verbal, adverbial, shifters, so-called spatial-temporal framing, intertextuality? How does he use chronotopes? What sensory stimuli are recruited into his devices of synesthesia? How does he phenotize and perform memory? Obviously, a work of such intellectual scope and vir verbal virtuosity presents a great many challenges to the translator, and I've been wrestling with these continuously through multiple drafts. It is crucial to get it right in this particular text, which unlike novels, for example, lacks the propulsive and unifying presence of plot and characters to ground and motivate the endless choices the translator must make. It is a matter not only of lexical and semantic accuracy, there is tone, rhythm, color, the shifting energies of the text. There are the many voices of the interpolated text, the rhetorical and poetic devices that rarely have their direct equivalence in English in the sense of making the reader's nerves vibrate to the same frequency to which the author has tuned them. It's crucial to get it right in Muratov's case because the affective and cognitive impact of his work depends not only on transmitting the information, which is why my translation has a gigantic number of footnotes that the reader is free to ignore, but also in choosing words and images in the target language that across nearly a century of cultural distance and change across the barriers of language would still do what Muratov did for his Russian readers. 
Murata is always aware, for example, of the multiple temporalities that exist in the present moment of his encounter with the landmarks, the landscape, the artifacts themselves. See, for example, the opening of his chapter on Ferrara. The traveler leaves the train and from the very first moment realizes there's no room for regrets. The avenue leading to the city, the quiet streets with grass sprouting between the flagstones, the squares drenched in sunlight, the sleepy palaces, the ringing of an old church bell, all fill you with a profound sense of peace. Ferrara gives the impression of a cemetery, and you feel the need to walk respectfully with bared heads among its tombs. Ferrara, like Pisa, Ravenna, and Venice, is one of the dead cities of Italy. Ravenna died so very long ago that now its mausoleums are already surrounded by the hustle and bustle of a wealthy provincial town. Pisa and Venice, on the other hand, still cling to the half-life of their famous monuments, and the two cities are gradually turning into museums. None of these, however, can rival Ferrara's noble spectacle of the natural decline of objects that were, once upon a time, the materialization of human beliefs, passions, and talents. Ferrara has fallen silent, and nowhere is silence a more solemn emblem of death than it is in this city where so many poets compose their songs. In one sense, Murato's text is a vast meditation on memory, on its construction, preservation, transmission, and decay. This is why he is so occupied with time and why he takes pains to structure his exposition in a way that will involve, include, and compel readers to navigate into identical vortex of temporalities to experience at once the jolt of dislocation from the present and the connection to the past, and to project a future deja vu moment from which to reflect back at themselves looking at the past. That is why, as one reads him, one needs to make room for all the reminiscences, all the reflections and reveries that Murata provokes in us, and that made his evocations of Italy so indispensable to six generations of Russian readers. As the author's late niece, Senia Muratova, the art historian, writes, Russian poets and writers of that period, Brok, Akhmakova, Bialitsvetaeva, Gumilyov, Khadasevich, as all of them were inspired in their writings by the sentiment of Italy transmitted by Muratov, one can say that the entire generation of Russian intelligentsia of the 20th century perceived Italy through the eyes and thoughts of Pavel Muratov. When the Russian symbolist poet, a contemporary of Muratov's, writes in his poem uh, Ravenna, the sea retreated long ago and roses stilled the crashing wave, so Theodoric, sleeping in his grave, might not hallucinate life's storms. Only by night, stooping to the bales, counting the sum of coming years, the shade of Dante with his eagle silhouette declaims his vita nuova to my ears. When Alexander Bloch writes these lines, he renders perceptible only to the conoscenti a subtle homage to Murata. He knows, as the English speaking world will soon learn, that the 150,000 words of evocations of Italy resurrect not one, but two vanished worlds the distant one of the Italian Renaissance and the more recent one of the Russian Silver Age. But more than cutting a window into a previously 
unexplored aspect of Russian cultural history that documents a specifically Russian humanist response from the final years of Russia's finest humanist moment to the Italian birthplace of humanism. Evocations of Italy gives the reader a transformative experience. As Muratov himself put it, the words traveling to Italy are tale-telling as they grasp our experience and our life in the Italian element, witness the liberation of new spiritual forces, the birth of new faculties, as well as the lengthening of the scale of our desires occurring in time and space. This is also a journey through the depths of our being and a firing of a resplendent circle at the bottom of our soul. This is what he had hoped to achieve with his text, which I believe he did achieve in Russian and which I hope some shadow of it will be palpable to those who will embark on a journey of reading Evocations of Italy. I would like to close by alerting you to the existence of a website dedicated to the work uh, and life of Pavel Muratov. It's a trilingual uh, website called Pavel Muratov Center Org. Um, and there you will find endless material on this um, endlessly fascinating writer. So uh, this is the opening page of the um, website of the Pavel Muratov International Center of Studies, which is housed in Rome. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I am very uh, eager to hear your comments and questions um, or share anything that you might want to uh, hear from me on this subject. So. I think we can get rid of the screen. The Muratovian silence has descended. Should we just ask or uh, do it through the chat function? Uh, I think, Shanti, you're the man in charge. Oh, yeah, I think just go ahead and ask. I think that's great. So, um, when I looked him up, it looked like he, after he left Russia, he spent relatively little time in, in Italy, like about four or five years before moving on to Paris and other places. So how did he, how did he absorb the, senti the, the sensibilities of, of Italy so thoroughly in such a short period of time? Well, he began his international travels actually in 1905 by visiting England and London, and there he became acquainted with the British esthetes and uh, promptly devoured the entire vast literature, uh, which was still being produced. But uh, So he armed himself uh, with a very, very rich library. So that was point number one. Um, and uh, his tra his actual trips, uh, uh, so he read voraciously, he translated, uh, in fact, Vernon Lee, he translated Pater, uh, he uh, translated novellas from the Russian, from the Italian Renaissance, uh, and he was the curator of Italian art from the Pomerantsev Museum in the pre-revolutionary years. So uh, mm -hmm. he had vast experience already as a young man, which is quite astonishing when you think about it. Uh, uh, he was also, uh, I, I think, endowed with a tremendous gift of fast writing and processing. Uh, and uh, he kept these notebooks on the road uh, and kept revising them um, uh, and issued these books step by step. 
so when uh, what's valuable, what I think is really particularly valuable about this trilogy of works is that it gives us an image of an Italy that disappeared definitively and totally after World War I. So this is a snapshot of Italy up to 1914. It represents at once a kind of the first Russian discovery of Renaissance and its last gasp. Uh, when Muratov returns to Italy after, uh, in 1926, after he actually makes another uh, much more modest journey, and this time he goes to Puglia, to Apulia, to the south. Uh, he goes uh, in the company of two of his friends and they go by motorcycle. So it's quite an adventure with a little side cart and they clatter around. And that particular uh, memoir is, is a, a completely different from the one um, that we have from the pre-World uh, War I travels. Um, it is already a lament for uh, technology for the, the technological um, transformation of Italy's big cities for uh, the kind of banalization of the landscape. Um, so uh, there, there's definitely a sense of a golden moment that has passed. And I think in this sense for us, it's extremely valuable to have a peek into this uh, uh, extraordinarily evanescent sort of culmination of rapture uh, with of an enraptured discovery of the best that Italian Renaissance art and thinking and the land and its people were, were as he was able to perceive them. And he read them, uh, as I say, through this prism, uh, this idealistic idea that somehow uh, it would be possible to recreate such a Renaissance. Uh, in Russia to bring it there, to, in a, to, to inculcate uh, uh, the country with this tremendous energy. He was so interested in uh, Russian Byzant to, in uh, Byzantine art and in Russian medieval art because it demonstrated and it was evidence of the unbroken link between the culture of Byzantium and the Mediterranean antiquity and Russian culture, a link that he wished could be strengthened and um, uh, amplified and in the service of which he placed himself. So uh, his work is all of a, of a, of a sort. So he, yes, does that uh, yes. uh, help address some yes. of your interests? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. It looks like we have a pair of questions in the chat. Oh, um, the one chat. of which is from Murray Leaf asking where your illustrations were coming from in the PowerPoint. Yes, uh, so I gave uh, the illustrations uh, are, um, I owe a debt to two sources, the family archives and um, the photographs that Zenia Muratova shared with me. And then those lovely horizontal images are the work of Gideon Bosker. Uh, a longtime collaborator and um, uh, who worked with whom I've worked on numerous projects. So uh, the, um, uh, as I said, this uh, project has been a kind of synthesis of many aspects of my life. Um, and so the uh, Northwestern University publication uh, will be illustrated uh, with appropriate um, images uh, that are the work of Gideon Bosker, who has just published a book of his photography, actually, with Sylvania Press in Milan. Uh, okay, so uh, let's see, volume a bit low. What was Muratov's relationship politically with Russia? Very good question. Uh, so um, Muratov did not leave Russia until 1922. Uh, between the, he was uh, attempted to make himself useful to the Bolsheviks uh, by preserving the uh, legacy of um, uh, the old Russian culture specifically. Uh, its icons and ecclesiastical um, works, uh, which he was the first actually in Russia as an art historian to uh, consider, to analyze, and to study. 
uh, aesthetically and not as cult um, uh, objects. Uh, in this respect, he contributed uh, the uh, original uh, work, seminal work on Russian medieval art in Igor Grabar's vol voluminous History of Russian Art, uh, which I think I showed an image of that cover that uh, on which Grabar was working. So what happened is that um, Muratov attempted to continue his work as an art historian, as a curator, as an archivist, but he ran afoul of the Bolsheviks. Uh, and uh, so he was um, uh, politically exiled and took refuge in Berlin, uh, where he joined the expat community for a few years before seeking his fortunes in Italy. Um, so he, ha he had to put together a rather precarious uh, financial existence, and that is a very interesting story as well. I might mention that um, he was associated in Paris for many years with a dealer of a French, um, oh, excuse me, of Russian antiquities uh, and of Russian imperial um, treasures and the treasures of Russian aristocrats in immigration, which was called A la Vieille Russie. And those of you who are familiar with New York or have been uh, before uh, its landscape continues to change, at the corner of Fifth Avenue and 59th Street was a two story exquisite gallery of A la Vieille Russie. Uh, to which um, uh, Muratov contributed his curatorial expertise. He also uh, was instrumental in um, organizing exhibits of Russian icons in the United States as well. So his work uh, found its way uh, to the US. Uh, so uh, he, and the, uh, as an indication of the fact that his, um, uh, ideology, uh, which was uh, stridently anti-Bolshevik, was um, uh, hostile uh, to the uh, Bolshevik and then Soviet authorities, um, is the fact that his work was not uh, printed, reprinted, until Piristroika, when it was finally reissued and made available to Russian readers in a number of editions, and is now very popular work and has been reinserted into uh, dialogue with contemporary writers such as Tatiana Tolstaya, who wrote uh, a short story in which she brings him back. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a great revival of Muratov in contemporary Russia. Okay, explain what is meant by Russian Silver Age. Nice question, thank you. Uh, so uh, these uh, kind of the, these metallic um, names for periods uh, to demarcate various cultural periods goes back, of course, to the um, uh, to uh, the uh, Hesiods. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm talking to Reed uh, alum, so I know you've all read Hesiod in Hume 110, uh, and so remember his periodization of um, uh, history into the various ages uh, of um, creation. So um, the uh, in uh, Russia, uh, the uh, first period of original Russian uh, literary production uh, occurred in the beginning of the 19th century around the work of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin, um, it was an extraordinarily fertile period of poetic production when uh, the full muscular uh, and nuanced value of the Russian language was made, put into the service of, uh, of uh, high art. And this was called the golden age of Russian literature, which came of Russian poetry, actually, uh, which came to a crashing halt, so it is said, uh, with the emergence of civic-minded agendas in literature. So put aside the great writers, Gogol, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Herzen, even uh, Leskov, who, um, uh, Turgenev, uh, whose works uh, were not uh, um, um, engaged 
directly with um, uh, political, that be, being the forum of political discourse, uh, then um, uh, really the, the truly, the peak period was this uh, uh, from 18, uh, from the first decade of the 1800s until about 1840, uh, until the death of Pushkin, the death of uh, Lermontov. So the second period is also marked by this um, uh, uh, efflorescence of poetry. So from a period that was largely distinguished by great novels, short stories, prose, Russian writers turned again to the short form of lyrical poetry uh, and uh, of the Russian decadence, the first and second generation of symbolists, uh, and they call this, they called the Silver Age. It lasted about 20 years. It was also a period marked by the birth of Russian abstract painting uh, and of Russian avant-garde, uh, of experimentation in music, of uh, uh, a robust uh, theological uh, exploration. Um, and all of that somehow came and uh, segued into the tremendous explosion of the revolution and its own creative and vital energy. So the Russian Silver Age uh, is uh, acknowledges uh, in a kind of, by the lowering of the standard, not gold, but silver, uh, that maybe uh, shows a sort of respect to the, to the earlier generation. I hope that helps. A little bit of myth, uh, and a little bit of fact. Anything else? Would you like to hear another little piece? Would that be fine? Are you up? Would you like to? Yes, I can't see. I don't know. Yes, that sounds wonderful. You can have a show of hands, and if the hands say, yes, let's read about Taormina and Etna, I think I have a little piece that will just um, take us to the end of our session. And that is um, Muratov's visit to Taormina in Sicily. That spring, two months after the earthquake that leveled Messina and Reggio, Taormina was deserted. The absence of human beings, in a way, revealed the true character of Taormina. The wind moaned less self-consciously in the abandoned gardens, and the clouds settled on the roofs of the empty hotels with less constraint. One began to understand how uneasy this place might be, positioned as it is, high in the mountains above the precipitous drop to the sea. A slate-colored cloud bank bore down on Etna and hid the peak. That night, a storm rolled in. Derelict shutters clattered in all the hotels. Lightning exploded every instant to the operatic roaring of the southern thunder. No one slept in Taormina that night. Storms are often a prelude to an eruption, and the memory of the Messina earthquake was still fresh in everyone's minds. By morning, everything was once again quiet. The air was still, saturated with the fragrance of trees in bloom. The sun came out, the flags, flagstones dried, and before long, they were swarming with lizards. From the Greek theater, the famous classical panorama of the Azure Sea, the rocky shore, and Etna came into view, but the top of the volcano was still invisible. As the clouds began to dissipate and melt, we grew more and more impatient to have a glimpse of the peak. The unmelting snows on its slopes were already beginning to glow with a piercing whiteness, and any moment we expected to see the peak itself, but in vain. We had a long wait in front of us, and as we waited, we came to understand that nothing could have given us a more accurate sense of Etna's great height than this gradual disappearance of the clouds shrouding its peak. 
For Taormina, Etna is everything. It fills half the sky. The transparent light that brings each of the crater's craggy facets into sharp relief and the smoky plume rising from its bowels give the landscape a wild, ominous feel. Viewed from the city, Etna is oppressive, grand, terrifying. By comparison with this titanic mountain, Vesuvius is a mere child's toy. Everything human withers and shrinks from proximity with the magical primordial of this mountain. Etna controls every one of the traveler's thoughts, drawing them inexorably towards itself. Every excursion traveler's plans seem inevitably to draw them into the volcano. They ascend the steep winding paths to Mola. When they arrive at this pitiful and filthy little mountain village, they feel at the end of the human world, at the very limit of what is habitable. In front, there is the sprawling flank of Etna, petrified seas of black lava throwing off strange reflections of the blistering sun next to sparkling expanses of snow. An icy current rises from them. On these heights, at this extreme limit of life, there is no longer anything of Italy or of Greek Sicily. In the beginning, Taormina was the home of the primordial indigenous Siculi. The Ionians established Greek Naxos lower down, closer to the seashore. When you leave Taormina and descend to the Ionian seashore, you have the feeling you're going down to join the citizens of the Greek world. When they stood on the shore and gazed out across the Ionian Sea and the ships racing across it, the Greeks of Sicily felt themselves to be members of the great Hellenic family. But woe to the islanders who looked out upon the sea without any prospect of sailing as, as free travelers. This is the kind of dramatic interplay Sicily breeds between the shore and the sea. The lament of Polyphemus forever resounds across his shores. Come to me, Galatea, and you will have a share in everything that is mine. Let the sea dash furiously against the shore. You will be happier spending the night here with me in my cave. Here you will find laurels, slim cypress, black ivy, and grapevines with sweet fruits. Here there is ambrosia, the sweet water Etna gives us from her white snows. Surely, you cannot prefer your sea and your waves to all of this. Along the Sea of Galatea, along the Cyclopic shores, lies our path to Italy. The Bay of Messina is not yet visible, but the mountains of Calabria that lie beyond it are already coming into view. Ahead of us lies the spectacle of cities ravaged by the earthquake. This is the spectacle of Italy in the grip of sorrow. The sorrow of Italy is the sorrow of all humanity because Italy is that happiness for the sake of which life is worth living. That's Thank it. you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you so much, Lana. Really You're appreciate welcome. it. Uh, thank you. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, the Foster Schultz Club Steering Committee uh, is planning additional speakers for next semester and we'll update the events calendars. Those are finalized, um, but thank you so much, Lena, we really appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you so much. It was such a joy. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Lena.